I'm Will Kunkel. I'm VP of Marketing at Starista. Um, Starista was predominantly known for being a data provider for a long time, but has evolved into a um, full-scale marketing, uh, digital marketing solutions provider. Um, we help clients uh, onboard data, use their, you know, provide first-party data to power all their campaigns. Um, I've been there a little over a year. Had a big sea change, obviously, a strange time to be doing business and a strange time to be onboarding, but it's been great. And with that, I will introduce Sachin, who is Vice President of Marketing at McAfee. Hey, uh, good to be here as well. This is Sachin. I lead uh, pretty much all of growth marketing, which, which comes to uh, full funnel marketing across customer acquisition for McAfee. Uh, and we are predominantly a uh, direct to consumer company only as we divested our enterprise business and I manage all acquisition across direct to consumer for, for McAfee. I'm excited to be here. I'm excited to be talking to you again. Um... I just want to let everybody who's listening know as well, the chat is open. So anything we say, whether you agree, disagree, think it's ridiculous, think it's the greatest thing you've ever heard or have a question, please feel free to drop it in the chat and we will address it toward the end. Um, I guess it's been, uh, you know, it's kind of been talked about ad nauseum in every one of uh, every discussion everybody's had for the last while. But um, I guess being in this, you know, in, in ostensibly sort of a security business, I would love to hear a little couple of things, I guess, two part question. One, what does marketing look like for you right now? Um, and two, what has business been like and what have been the paradigm shifts in strategy as, um, as obviously more people are in front of their screen more and security has been you know, kind of a job one for a lot of people in terms of you know, protecting themselves, their identity, their devices, et cetera. That, that's, that's, that's a great question. Well, so, um, so as I was mentioning, we are pure play consumer, direct to consumer company. So, pretty much operate more marketing is more like a business team. So I lead all acquisition and the PL sits within my team. Uh, one way in which we have evolved our business, especially our go to market is, um, is more around having a more full funnel view. So pretty much anything with respect to across all customer touch point are part of my team, whether it is media, it is a dot com. Uh, branding around their uh, conversion down to the funnel. So this whole uh, uh, first point to check out as well as all the life cycle management is, is across within our team. So that's how we have structured and, and what that presents a really good and interesting opportunity for us to really message as well as develop that kind of an engagement and ongoing dialogue with the customers as, as we think about in holistic. So that's, that's how we are set up in terms of marketing, just like any other B2B, B2C or direct to consumer um, company out there from marketing standpoint. Uh, as a business, you, you said it absolutely right, Well, for what we have observed in last one and a half to two years, the need for cybersecurity has evolved quite significantly, especially in consumers. As consumers learn more that the shift is not about just the device that you're protecting, but it's all about your, yourself, your family, your household, your loved, your near and dear ones, and the little ones or not so little ones in the other room who are exposed to uh, all kinds of content online. So it's become a very, very much about personal protection. Uh, and that's what we have evolved into. Um, with, with pandemic, what we have seen is, as you were mentioning, more people are online. And so is the case that opens up uh, very easy ground for, um, for people to attack, cyber attacks and things like that. You have heard about or you'll read about breach uh, often. So how do we keep consumers protected is the mission and vision with which uh, we go to market, whether it is from marketing or a, or a product positioning and brand. So that's that has been evolving and that's something which has been on the forefront how we go to market. Um, so there is that. Inherently from business standpoint, we are a subscription business. So a lot drives on lifetime value of the customers. We we feel lucky that we are in this business, which is a trust business. So when customers choose to come with McAfee, they stay with us longer because generally consumers don't switch um, and start giving their SSN and other uh, sensitive information to other providers just because somebody is giving a discount. So that allows us to have a more longer term view, bring in the customers, maintain LTV, and then kind of operate with this LTV framework, which uh, I feel in a longer run works out very well from economic standpoint. Sure. And, and to your point about lifetime value of customers, et cetera, I think, um, you know, I think it's, I wouldn't call it a failing, but maybe um, 
a lot of companies spend a lot of time on acquisition, but not necessarily a lot of time on retention or on nurturing existing customers. How do you kind of bifurcate, whether it be from a content perspective or a marketing perspective, what you send out there to those two, to, you know, the people you're trying to get to come on board versus the people that are, you know, engaged, happy customers, or at least hopefully happy customers. We, we don't do a very sorted line that, hey, now you have acquired and now you've become an existing customer. We kind of maintain a more continuum approach. Um, and LT, I, I would highly advise for all marketers to adopt an LTV model. So the very first time as I was setting up, setting this operations up about two years ago, uh, the first thing I accomplished is what is the LTV of all our subscribers? And then we have built the mission and vision of the organization around driving that LTV. So anything and everything that we do is around audience and nurturing those audiences, connecting back to the LTV for, for the greater good. So how we, we go to market, we always, so we have a variety of different ways in which we go. So for example, people, as they buy any PC, we have Mac have pre-installed in that. So right from day one, we, um, we our life cycle management is around how do we add value from get-go? Like A, educating our customers around what, what, are the, what are the ways they can keep themselves as well as the family protected? Easy way so that they can take those protections to their mobile devices and start having that dialogue and easy access to the, the content that we are developing. And that kind of continues. And we have an internal formal process in which our acquisition and retention team work together in terms of what is the handoff as well as transition from an customer who was prospecting customers to an actual customer and kind of go from there. So we maintain that continuum. Look and feel, the positioning, content use uh, approach is very similar and it, it almost feels like a continuum for the customers from that standpoint. And, and I feel that has worked out very well for us. There are of course opportunities which we find across the board, which is what experimentation is all about. Uh, but that's how we have approached it. And the whole acquisition is built on LTV. So me and my counterpart who, who leads retention, we, we, we have regular conversation. Our teams have regular conversations. How do we grow the LTV? So sometimes we bring customers in at a, at a point where it made sense for them to come with a lower, lower package or the package that gives them the basic, the base level of security. And then we work with, with our, uh, our, Men, uh, life cycle management across the retention to kind of upsell them or bring them and protect their broader family. So that's, it's kind of a two-way two -way process. You need retention to grow LTV so that you can acquire more and you want to acquire more so that you can grow retention. So it's kind of a circular loop from there onwards. Sure. Um, I guess I was going to ask too, I was just citing like a personal example. I remember, I guess it was a couple of years ago, I had a client who um, their average user was about 72 years old. And they said, what should we be doing on TikTok and Snapchat? And my answer was probably nothing or a bare minimum. If, if it's something you're really excited about and want to try, but I wouldn't count on it generating a ton of leads or a ton of new business. Um, how do you, I mean, there's been so many sort of emerging channels and emerging opportunities from, I think the very real ones for all marketers from like the drop in linear viewing and the increase in OTT and CTV to things like I said, like Snapchat or TikTok and emerging channels. How do you balance the tried and true and what's historically worked and continues to work with investing in those more experimental or, or maybe not, I mean, they're all kind of part of the everyday parlance now, but those other emerging channels that, you know, how do, how do you balance that? Yeah, well, let me get to your question, but I, I do want to set the ethos. So the ethos of growth marketing is to challenge the status quo. Because if you do the status quo, you'll get status quo results. So the whole sure. idea around growth marketing is around how uh, is establishing that mindset of challenging and then experimenting our way across. So that's a very important cultural element that I would, I feel that it, I've tried it at a few places and it worked really well and it has helped us achieve acceleration, whether it is the cybersecurity industry or I was doing live entertainment before this at StubHub and it really helped us with that experimentation. Even at HP, when we were setting this up in 2003, 13 and 14, that mindset helps. How do we test? Um, so there is a constant focus on innovation. So every time we do financial forecast, the part of the financial forecasting will embeds uh, element of testing and learning and growing. So our CFO knows what kind of tests we are going to run. And I've built a very simple funnel. How many tests are we going to run? What is the win rate of that test? And what is the bank opportunity for us or uplift that we will get from the business? 
So that has sped in quarter over quarter. What that allows us to keep the budget bandwidth resource and focus towards testing and learning the newer channel, whether it is TikToks of the world, whether it is Snapchat, or even newer channels. I know a lot of a lot of marketers out there, they, they try a lot on linear TV. Uh, we are a lot more audience focused. So for us, we have been dabbling with connected TV and OTT. That has worked out really well because it allows us to be more personalized uh, and kind of go from there onwards. We have expanded towards more mid panel on the social as well. So, so long story short, we do constant testing. And the focus on that testing is as we have established our benchmarks of our success rate, we know the very first time that we will do a test, it may not work. But if you believe conceptually, uh, as well as uh, financially and economically that this channel could drive and where it fits into the funnel, our focus is more around optimizing it. Again, it is around the full funnel. I know many times uh, I've seen, I've made that mistake and I know a lot of time other uh, marketers fall to this trap as well. Hey, let's use that existing page and just roll it out. You have to think about the journey end to end. So whenever we test something, we think of the customer journey across end to end. So there are new landing page experiences that we will build or even sometimes new cart altogether. So that allows us to provide that seamless flow to the customers across the board and the type of customers we're going after. Yeah, and you mentioned, like I said, CTV has probably been the biggest, most predominant thing we've been asked and we're, we're really good at it, thankfully, but it's something that comes up constantly now because I think it's inarguable, the linear shift. And like I said, you know, uh, I mean, an another big shift in the industry I would say I want to ask you about is uh, we're not breaking news here, but like the cookie, uh, an increasingly cookie-less world, um, whether it's personalization or whatever else, how are you tackling cookies kind of going away or at least, you know, kind of one foot out the door at this point? Um. We, we are lucky to some extent that we, we have a direct con connection point with the customers from first party data. So, we, so, so to that extent, we, we've been using a lot of our first party data, both for engagement standpoint with the customers, but also being able to understand contextually what is relevant to the customer. And, and that is, those are the insights that we are trying to do uh, leverage for whether it is our advertising or whether it's on social media or broader media. That's how we're kind of approaching it. Um, also, what, wherever we could use first party data, we leverage that as experiences. So even if we are prospecting with look like audience to some extent, when they come to our site, we know what segments are coming in and then we will change the landing page experience based on our first party data. If it is an existing customer or ever had that relationship with McAfee, we can change that experience right away. Or if it is in the local like segment, that's where we, we constantly test. Having said that, and I've had a few talks on this as well, and I think it's a will, will it's a huge talk. I do feel there is a need for customer privacy and that is non-negotiable. Um, having said that, the, the answer with which industry is approaching is very siloed. Platforms are approaching it. Let me solve for my platform. Let me solve for my platform. What that is creating is it is not only creating challenges for advertisers, it's raising the cost of acquisition or retention across the board for every marketer out there. But also I do believe there is an element of personalization which is going away, which is uh, not good for end consumer end of the day. As a consumer, when I go to somebody's website or if I'm interacting with an ad, I would rather be uh, associated with just something which is more relevant. I went to Michigan, so I don't want any Ohio State ads coming on my social view. I would rather have go blue as much as possible or the states that I follow in. Uh, versus a non-relevant ad. So I think that relevancy would likely suffer. And my my call to action to the industry is like, how do we bring industry together to have a more industry-wide solution, which A, is uh, is to some extent is uh, guided by a more uh, neutral party, maybe government involvement, B, uh, it ensures customer privacy, consumer privacy, and C, it allows uh, a level playing field for all different companies to come together and provide some kind of an exchange. And the exchange is the trust and the right usage of consumer data and adding back to that particular system. So more like a unified ID or unified DMP. <clears throat> yeah, that, that there's an interestingly like fine line between privacy and relevancy, right? Like um, to your point about Michigan, right? Like I certainly wouldn't want, I wouldn't want something, you know, getting an email communication about like from a competitive, uh, a competitive university or I'm a Met fan. I wouldn't want a Yankee email, sure. but it's interesting. The guy who runs my content team actually said, maybe this is crossing the line. He got an email from someone like a sales 
traditional kind of sales, you know, like kind of meet and greet type email that said, hey, I couldn't help but notice you were a Met fan who also likes the Giants and watches Nick games. And he was like, it's getting to the point where like for someone I don't know and have not engaged with in any way, it's getting a little creepy. So I think finding that, you know, balance, like I said, people and consumers, I don't think they know exactly where they're at on it either because they do want relevant um, communications. But if you, if you step over that line, they start to feel infringed upon. Um, I was laughing the other day because I ordered paper towels and about 10 seconds later, I got a review request. What did you think of your paper towels? And I was thinking, well, you know, they, <laughs> they, they cleaned up the spilled coffee or the ice cube or whatever, you know, they did their job. Like, I'm not sure I'm going to take time to write a review, but. I think it is important and marketers as, as a community, all of us have to be, be responsible around that too as well. Um, I do feel over communication or to some extent, uh, the lack of relevancy is going to hurt our, um, consumers in general. I'm a consumer as well, to just building on, on your point. I received solicitation email like across the board. People have started building videos and I think the technology is great where you can personalize the video with contextual information. Sometimes you have personal information, but there's a fine line where you stop and where it turns into invasion of privacy versus being just being relevant. But I do feel there is a need for relevancy and finding that right balance requires a more neutral party and platforms to come together versus everybody trying to solve that in isolation. Yeah, and, and it's funny to your point um, about like, about just like initial emails or sales emails or, 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 you know, us being, you know, whether you're a consumer marketer or a B2B marketer, you're still a person who absorbs content, likes to be served things in a certain way. I got a subject line email the other day. 32 words in the subject line. It was like every buzzword you can imagine. And I was like, I, I can't even get past the subject line. I'm certainly not going to read the content. Um, I think a big question, I know you, we kind of did the reverse. It sounds like I started out in, uh, you know, consumer electronics and automotive marketing and have gone to B2B. You sound, it says you had said you started out in B2B and went to, you know, B2C. What do you think that the two could learn from each other? What do you think B2B marketers could learn from B2C and vice versa? I think most, um, about a decade in both sides, I feel the the vernacular, the vocabulary and nomenclature might be different, but the approach is very similar. Like for example, as we were talking the other day, I feel B2C marketers talk about personalization day in, day out, um, and actually work on towards that as well. B2B marketers do the exactly same. They just call it as ABM, account-based marketing, which is, which is nothing but being personalized. Um, so I think that is uh, certainly a similarity. I do say that um, a large portion of that is still driven towards account versus person. B2C is all about person versus an account. And I feel people are like, I'm, I'm an individual, but I'm also a B2B marketer, a B2B decision maker. So from that standpoint, approaching people from content standpoint, engaging and developing that trust and interest maybe upper in the funnel uh, is something B2C does really well. Like B2B, B2C invests uh, very heavily in brand, B2C invests very heavily towards developing that connect with the person at the individual level versus the broader context. And I feel th those can be leveraged in B2B very well. The other, um, at least when I was doing B2B, the data was limited to some extent. A lot has happened since then from in the B2B world as well. But for B2C, the best in class is always around connecting the full funnel. So first thing I would say is for B2B, close the loop. Close the loop uh, in terms of the customer attribution so that you can connect back, whether it's the LTV that we were talking about earlier. So you can connect back every investment that you're making to the financial implications that is happening. Now, it's an easier problem to state than actually done, but that requires a close coordination and partnership with the sales team. Because the sales for, for B2B, the sales event happened in the sales team. And I think connecting that data back so that you could do more of that is something that B2C does day in, day out, pretty much. We just have machines doing that to some yeah. extent of processes doing that. You might have to build a little bit of a manual process here and maybe some level of automation there as well. Um, so that that's, uh, that's something that I would say. And the other thing I would say is test. Test, test, test. We do more than 200 tests a day, uh, a quarter. Uh, there is no better way of running marketing today than to test and experiment. Uh, and I know some B2B marketers definitely do that, but explore, open your horizon. Explore that advertising platform that you have not, you have been kind of saying, oh, this is all B2C. 
explore that social channel that you have always been saying, oh, this is B2C. Uh, of course, you have to be contextually relevant and the content that you are developing is relevant to that particular platform, but explore, test those, those markets. Um, uh, and, and I think the returns would be definitely much better than you would have probably expected. But I do feel there are a lot of similarities between the two. It's just that uh, B2B and B2C call them differently to some extent. Yeah, it's interesting. And I think, you know, it's changing. The B2B clients have historically been a little bit more gun shy with overspending on certain channels or, or experimentation. But I've always said, whether I was on the client side or the agency side, a campaign's only as expensive as the result, the return you get on it, right? Like if you if you spend fifty thousand, but the average lifetime value of one customer is one hundred and fifty thousand, I mean, it pays for itself. So it's one of those things, you know, you have to kind of swing. And you know, if you're if you're a really good marketer, you're going to miss sometimes, right? To your earlier point, the people who play it safe, you get status quo results that might make the CFO happy in terms of it not being, you know, nothing having gone down. But if nothing goes up after a while, it doesn't look so so wonderful either. So um, you're absolutely right. Since you mentioned CFO, one of my closest buddy or one of the my closest partner internally is our CFO. It's not just here, but everywhere that I've worked is to work very closely with our CFO organization. So establishing that economics of LTV focus and the efficient acquisition is what basically drives uh, the growth mindset, in my opinion. I've, it's easy to fall to the trap of, hey, give me my budget and let me stay within a budget. But if you establish that economic model, which is, a, and then you are constantly delivering that, lifetime value, then you can actually raise your investment as well. So instead of solving for investment, solve it, solve for more long-term customer value and, and, and financial value for the company. And that's where the CFO organization will start working with you. It takes a while, be patient, work at it, have the equation ready that, so you can show that particular equation, do a couple of tests and, and, and take some risk uh, from that standpoint. And it will turn out well. Yeah, I'm still shocked at how many companies have like, let's say a creative or a marketing department that just doesn't talk to sales, doesn't have a constant feedback loop because neither one of them are going to do particularly well without the other. I mean, I do think whether it's brand side or agency side, the traditional silos are starting to collapse a little bit because, um, and, and what creativity means, I think is changing a little bit too, because um, it used to be all about the headline or the concept. Now I think it's a, it's sort of a, a, a loop or a continuum of, you know, knowing what's going to work from a strategic standpoint, what's going to drive revenue. Um, there's just so many more factors to consider. I miss kind of when I got out of school and they were like, just show me 25 headlines for Xbox. And I was like, I can do that. You know, it's a little bit more, I'm a little bit more accountable now, but um, I guess to that end from a, from a, you know, creative or marketing perspective, how much do you, uh, it's another thing people constantly sort of seem to vacillate on. And sometimes they hire a whole team in house. And then a year later, they're using an external agency or they use a mix. What does your marketing mix look like from a, from an in-house versus an external agency perspective? Um mostly in-house uh, and then we uh, we also work with agencies for uh, special access to a certain content or an inventory uh, or to a particular market where we don't have presence or we are testing in a particular market and to some extent certain capability. Um, they both have their own pros and cons. Uh, I think the scalability that you could accomplish with agencies is enormous, it's infinite, right? Because they have the talent and the pool and the access and the contacts and the expertise that already exists. So I've operated in both. We have more hybrid, I would say, but it is 80-20 to some extent, 80% in-house and 20% external. Um, it would vary as we scale up, but one thing that would not change is the data ownership stays with us. And, and this is one thing that I've learned very early in my career is always bring your data in-house so that you have access to the data. It is proprietary information of the company and it is a very strategic information and mix it with the, with the, third, with the first party data. So bring in the media impression data, bring in the uh, second party data where you could and then and build a CDP or a DMP where you can map the first party data with this third party data so that you can generate more better, richer and timely audience insight. There is no better way of going to the market than to understand your customers. And you could only do that when you own the data. So as we evolve, uh, well, our, we might go to 70, 70, 30, or maybe 65, 35 as we scale up in terms of internal versus external, but we'll, we'll keep the ownership of the data. And, yeah, and we're on a much smaller scale, obviously, but we've kind of done the same thing. We've doubled in size literally over the last couple of years. So um, we were traditionally all in-house, which I think there are, as you had said, there are benefits because those people live and breathe your brand every day. 
but conversely, they're living and breathing that brand every day. So it's nice to get an external opinion. We have a couple of, you know, we have a couple of really good external agency relationships that we can say, hey, we need to do something completely different or something fresh or, you know, inviting in some other thinking when you're when you're navel gazing or drinking your own Kool-Aid every day. It's good to get that, especially when it's someone who's not afraid to give an opinion and will come in and say, you know, this is getting a little stale. We could try this or, you know, suggest a new channel, new campaign, whatever. Um, I guess I was going to ask next, um, what, I mean, just even outside of your current role, what have you seen from the start of your career to now as the biggest sort of sea changes? Um, it's funny, I get, I get sometimes, like my, one of my sons is, a, um, he's majoring in marketing, but on the creative side. And sometimes I don't even know what to tell them because a lot of what they're showing them in school is kind of how things worked 20 years ago. You know, art director, copywriter, working in a vacuum, reporting to the creative director. And like we were saying before, it's a lot more integrated now. But what have you seen as, would you say, is the biggest kind of, you know, paradigm shift? Um, I think we should talk about this, but I think it's reality now. Like eight or nine years ago when this shift was happening, it was like, oh, we have to do marketing in the digital era. It is digital era pretty much as much as it could be. So I think back in the days, there were fewer channels that you could go out to and engage with the customers. And usually mass, mass communication was an easy me mechanism to reach out to a much wider, richer audience in a, in a, in a bigger scale. Uh, so that's where the creative becomes very, very important. One thing that has not changed, creative is still king. Content is still king and it has not changed at all. But the vehicle with which you deliver that and then how, when, where, and to who has evolved. Uh, and that, I believe, is one of the biggest, biggest sea change that has happened from marketing being this only a creative org, um, creative org, which is thinking about this big thinking and uh, sentiments and et cetera, and then building a creative, which will make people get tears with joy or something else. It's driving a certain behavior, but it is at a mass level. That has evolved to a more targeted. You still have to do everything from the creative standpoint, but marketers have to also wear multiple hats. Uh, so more or less marketing organizations has evolved into more of a GM role today, where you have, you have to wear your creative hat to be able to be innovative and come up with a creative design. You have to be a researcher to understand that customer journey and customer insight. Uh, you also have to be a media expert to be able to understand how media is operating. You also have to be a digital expert in terms of understanding customer journey. You have to be a little bit of a technologist to understand uh, how does a MarTech work? Because imagine there are 2,000 companies in marketing technology alone. Uh, not everybody has the right solution out there. So for you to be able to quickly sniff and understand what the vehicle would be, uh, you also have to be a data expert, being able to run your own um, uh, research, your own reports, uh, as well as look at the data and do your own analysis to some extent or have the right member. You also have to be a very, very strong financial manager, uh, almost like a CFO. Talk the CFO language, understand all the language around what is EBITDA, how does it contribute to the overall contribution margin, how does the LTV works, what is the economics, understand the economic principle. You also have to be a solid, inspiring leader as well. And that hasn't changed, but now the 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 audience as well as the employee base that you have is also very diverse. You're dealing with very, very rich set of diverse audiences, diverse um, employee base who are bringing different expertise. That is great because it drives creativity, it drives innovation, but it also poses a challenge like how to keep them together and how to have this really well meshed team, which is feeding on each other and developing with each other uh, and that becomes, I feel the leadership becomes one of the most important pieces because you will have all these different experts. Imagine you have a data scientist talking to a psychology researcher. How do you make them talk to each other? And then you have this creative person like, oh, I don't think this shade of blue is right. And it is two shades. How do you have a person having that conversation that you appreciate so much with, with a data scientist? Like, well, my data is, is, is not aligning with that and trying to figure out how do I get that different shades of blue. So I think that has evolved quite a bit. So I, in a nutshell, I think marketing is becoming more of a business driver more so today. And the need for general management as well as expertise in different areas is way more important than, than your own trade, uh, which I think is a great opportunity for everybody in this audience. And I'm sure everybody welcomes that particular change. It's challenging, but I think it is also very refreshing and rewarding at the same time. Yeah. 
And I've definitely seen the shift in thinking, or at least attitudinally a little bit about marketing always having been a cost center. Now it's really a revenue driver or a lead generator at the very least. So yeah, it's uh, we're getting our due finally. And, uh, you know, generally, hopefully the budgets reflect that. But um, yeah, it's, I mean, you could theoretically, even just from managing people, you could have four generations within a company at this point. So uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a lot, but somebody in the uh, chat actually had a good question that I think is a kind of at the tail end of what you were saying. They were asking for you as a senior leader in an organization that's growing and hiring, how do you balance time spent in the hiring process with management and strategy? And I'll add creative to that because I'm sure you have responsibilities and culpability over the creative as well. Um, and you address some of it, but yeah, how do you just sort of divvy up the day and, and make sure everything gets you know equal share? I think one of the key things that at least I've been prophesizing and, and learned in my business, and that's why I always talk about internally, is like, this is a talent business. The, the, the levels with which we can achieve is through the talent that we have. So I spent quite a bit of a time in A, talent development and hiring. So as, as you know, we are always hiring. Just growth marketing is always hiring because we are always on uh, in terms of business as well. And I think our businesses, what we're doing is working as well. So that allows us to constantly hire and grow and broaden our um, skill set as a team. Um, so I spent quite a bit of time. So I work very closely with the HR team. So HR team, we have dedicated members who work with us. So they understand the, the type of talent we are going in with the type of uh, skill set that we are looking. We have evergreen jobs where we are constantly looking for that talent pool to come and join our team. Um, so spend more, just spend quite a bit of time just educating our HR team members and recruiters to kind of reach and, and qualify the candidates that are coming in, or even if it is an information conversation, so I spent quite a bit of time on that. And all my leadership team understand this as well. So we spend active time towards that. Second <clears throat> is nurturing your team members. It's much, I would say rather easier to present and allow for the personal growth of an internal team member versus the external, when, versus trying to hire. It's the same thing with customer as well. The customer acquisition cost is higher than yeah. returning. And so I spent a kind of bit of time, like just going two or three levels down in the organization is having those one-on-ones. Uh, the other thing is, it's also how you show up in the team meetings. Like, do you bring in your title and the gravitas towards it, or you bring in your expertise and you're just one of the one of the others. Uh, so, so I think approaching team members with that, I spent quite a bit of time I, uh, ideating with them. So they are seeing you more as a idea generator as well as somebody who's ready to take and willing to take risks. So we spent quite a bit of time like again, people. Uh, the culture, the growth culture that we have developed here is also developed by the team members. I'll give you one example. So every quarter we do something called as growth awards. My team members develop and conceptualize what that award is. Like, hey, Ben's best pizza maker or best helper or somebody who goes extra mile. These are just examples of things that they sure. come. But I don't decide or any of the leadership team members don't decide who's the winner. It's actually developed and decided by the team. They come up with the categories, they decide who's the winner and we celebrate together. Um, there are social events that we do. The re this has become even more important now than ever before in my previous career, uh, career is uh, that keeping people engaged is very, very important especially this, this uh, generation, the newer generation that we're dealing with because they're hungry, they want more and they want to try more. Uh, so developing that, so, and I'm giving a long wide end answer, but there is no better way you could spend your time than to just uh, focusing on talent development. So I spent quite a bit of time on that, I would say actively. Uh, and then of course, from the strategic standpoint, um, constantly as we're having a conversation with our CX team, it's all around where are we going? What are the key investments that you want to uh, want to make? What are the capabilities that are needed today and in the next uh, two to three years and beyond? And how do we start building talent pipeline as well as investments on our technology and broader infrastructure to go there? So spend some time on that as well. And then of course, always, always, always stay close to operations. Uh, know your dashboards, know how, how, how the sausages make or the pizza is made or the wine is made so that you could actually connect the dots from top to the bottom, very important. You can be in everything, you cannot dictate everything, but having visibility and spending some time on that allows you to connect the dots. That's, that's I think I spend it, most of my time. I think it's so important what you said about going a couple of levels down and meeting with people, because I, one thing I found across companies is that let's say even like a director level and above or a manager, depending on the size of the company, everybody's got kind of like next steps 
or a somewhat maybe clear or only marginally cloudy view of how they're going to get to the next step. People who are, you know, a year, two years, three years into their career, they may sit there and like, they, you, it's hard to say how invested they are because they may not have equity if it's a, you know, a private company or, or, or even a publicly held company that offers stock. They may just not know if they're doing a great job or a bad job because, you know, they're sort of just doing their job and no one's coming to talk to them. That's one thing I've, uh, especially here, we, we have a relatively, about half of my team, it's their first or second job out of school. And I've tried to spend a lot of time with them in terms of, um, I mean, I hope they stay forever, but the reality is I always tell them, you know, wherever you go in your career, I want you to be armed. I want you to have done something valuable, not just for us, but for yourself while you're here, because what you don't want to do is one specific thing. Like you don't want to be the person who just puts the grill on the Buick and then try to go do a job completely something else. And you can only reference that experience. I try to give them all a chance to work, you know, to, to work on everything we work on and be as strategic and as involved as they want to be. Very wisely said. And I think that's, that's just the way it, the people are going to spend certain time with you and you want to make sure that you are adding value and they are adding value. Yeah, it's by direction versus one direction in my opinion. 100%. I, I love it. I think over the last, you know, 18 months or so, um, our ideas of, you know, leadership and management have, you know, drastically changed, and, you know, in terms of keeping team morale high, keeping teams productive and, uh, you know, just working with people across the board. I mean, managing people remotely and leading remotely, it's, it's a whole different animal. So I love to hear that, Will. I think it's a, it, that, that's a really a powerful thing that you do. And again, Sachin, I mean, I, I can't even pick just one thing that you said today. It's all, all super insightful and awesome. So thank you both for being here and spending your time with us. Thank you everyone here on Zoom and on YouTube that tuned in today. Uh, we're thrilled to have you and, and hopefully we'll have you both back again soon. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. And uh, Sachin, it was great talking to you. I appreciate it. Likewise, have a good day. Cheers. You have too. a great week and a wonderful holiday weekend. Thanks all. Take care. Take care everybody. Bye. We're done for today and uh, everybody out there in Brand Innovators streaming land, you can tune in tomorrow for our name, image and likeness event with Influential looking all around uh, the new world of collegiate athletes uh, now that they can make money and, and take on endorse endorsements and brand partnerships. So that should be a really fun one. Hope to see you there.